Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, my name is Pil Hyung Lee from Asan Medical Center here in Seoul, South Korea. It is my pleasure to give you a warm welcome to TCT AP and AP Valve 2020 virtual. The meeting will start with a special session related to the link between the COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. Three distinctive international experts will each talk about the issues of utmost interest to us, which are cardiac injury, role of RAS inhibition, and thrombotic complications in patients with COVID-19. The topics addressed in this session are important not only for us, the practitioners, but also for many of our patients at high risk for COVID-19. Dr. David Capodano from AOU Policlinico Vittorio Emanuel, University of Catania in Italy, and Dr. Dogu Park from Asan Medical Center in Korea will moderate this session. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, D.W. Park from Asan Medical Center, Seoul, Korea. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to TCTAP AP Valve 2020 virtual meeting. As you know, until recently, more than 10 million people in the world were infected with COVID-19, and the number of new cases is uh, still skyrocketing in many regions. Therefore, we will start this year TCTAP virtual meeting with the COVID-19 special session. This session is entitled COVID-19 and the cardiovascular disease. I'm very happy to introduce co-moderator, Dr. David Capodano, University of Cantana, Italy. He's editor-in-chief Euro intervention. Also, it is honor to introduce distinguished cardiologist as a virtual discussion in this special session, Dr. Aleid Kiefo, from San Rafael Hospital, Italy, Dr. Bill Gogas, Nanjing First Hospital, China, Dr. In Chol Kim, Gemyeong University Dongsan Hospital, Korea, Dr. Mamas Mamas, Kili University, UK. David, could you start this session and introduce the first speaker? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Park. It's really a pleasure to be here with you and uh, with uh, many friends who I see uh, online. It's a different uh, environment uh, compared with the one we are used to, but at the same time, it's uh, uh, good to be uh, together in uh, one way or another and, uh, and share and share the experience that many of us uh, had had during the last uh, months with the COVID-19. So, of course, we have to talk about uh, the reason why we are here in this virtual environment rather than in person in uh, Seoul, uh, like uh, every year. And the reason is this uh, disease, uh, and we will discuss the uh, reasons that, uh, of course, uh, uh, make mm -hmm. cardiologists aware of this uh, uh, important uh, topic. And uh, there are three topics that we will mention. So I would ask uh, the first speaker, who is uh, Roxana Meron. Hello, Roxana, to share uh, her thoughts uh, about the association between uh, COVID-19 and myocardial injury, which is, of course, very important uh, for our job. Thank you so much, Dr. Park, Dr. Capodano, ladies and gentlemen, and it is just such an incredible honor to come to you live from New York City, where we were the epicenter of COVID-19, and I'm happy to report that the number of cases have dropped with a positivity rate of 0.96 of the 17,000 plus, pa uh, plus uh, patients who were just tested on Friday, only 0.96 were positive. So I think we're doing extremely well. But let me just say that how proud I am to be part of TCT Asia Pacific and TAP Valves 2020, even though in this virtual way, we're connected through the world, as you can see today with all of these incredible speakers, as well as uh, the moderator and as well as uh, our discussants. So it's really a tremendous honor for me to be here today. And today I was asked uh, in a short talk to talk to you about COVID-19 and myocardial injury. Let me just say that I really have no disclosures about COVID-19, except that I was in the uh, epicenter uh, just a few months back. But personally, I do have disclosures that you should all note. Um, but really, none of it is relevant to this talk. What's incredible to me uh, over the last past few months with this pandemic, there's been a research publishing phenomenon that I've never seen 
ever before in, in 25 years um, uh, in clinical trials and clinical research. If you look at the Nature Index, and I did this on June 20, uh, on June 4th, with COVID-related publications, in 2020, there's over 30,000 publications with reprints of 5,638. If you look at the NIH Library of Medicine, just on the topic of myocardial injury, over 140 articles um, on COVID-19 and myocardial injury. So this is a very big topic. So put your seatbelts on, but note that I'm not going to cover 140 articles. So I've decided to kind of start from the beginning on how we define myocardial injury. And I think we go to the fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction and looking at myocardial injury and understanding how well they have looked at this uh, with, um, uh, with the consensus group in trying to um, uh, define myocardial injury in a way that we can all speak the same language. If we just look at the elevation of cardiac troponin, there is, they have looked at this with rise and fall or a level being stable. And if there's acute ischemia, we're really thinking about acute myocardial infarction. But if there's not acute ischemia, there's acute myocardial injury. And I think that's where, that's where we are with COVID-19, although we could also be on this end as well. And remember one thing, this is really such a new pandemic. And whatever we're talking about is very much we're sort of defining it as we're going along and learning more and more as we're receiving more and more data. And I think it's an important concept to take away first and foremost, that nothing that I say today is definitive, but I, what I can say is that myocardial injury is important when you have a patient with COVID-19. The mechanisms in acute infection has been uh, well um, put out before even COVID-19 came out in a, a review article in the New England Journal of Medicine, kind of talking about the severity of, of infection and the risk of cardiovascular events that is proportional to this severity of infection. And interestingly, the risk is higher in the beginning, and you can see that here, of infection, and then it decays over time. And this was with pneumonia complicated by sepsis, has nothing to do with COVID-19, but it's just in the setting of an acute infection. And after all, COVID-19 is an acute infection. So what do we have in COVID-19? About a third of the patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 have some form of myocardial uh, injury as defined by having an elevated troponin. And if that's what we do and we just take it as that, that's where we're, we are. And this has been well-defined on multitudes of uh, different uh, studies that have been published. And uh, many of these patients actually do not have a prior history of cardiovascular disease. And it's very interesting, the plethora of the mechanisms that can be involved in myocardial injury and COVID that can go from a direct myocardial injury with viral um, uh, infection to sepsis disseminated uh, coagula intravascular coagulation that I know Dominic, Dominic and Angel Dr. Angelilo will take care of. But also we've seen um, uh, venous thromboembolic disease, myocarditis, some plaque rupture, all of it has been seen, but uh, very interesting to note that common in COVID, but unclear how often it causes an elevated troponin is the disseminated intravascular coagulation, sepsis and pulmonary hypertension, RV dilatation and venous thromboembolic disease. And I think it's important to kind of put that in the context of how we're looking at myocardial injury. So there are patterns of injury. Some of them are predominant cardiac presentation, but most commonly, as we all know, COVID-19 is more of a respiratory presentation. And um, when they do have an, a myocardial injury, it's very consistent with a type 2 MI with elevated enzyme, progressive elevation of troponin and biomarkers of elevation of inflammation. 
And when there is a predominant cardiac presentation, it's more of about a, a type 1 MI with chest pain, hypotension, and EKG abnormalities, more rare. This is a more common uh, 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 presentation of what we're seeing. The mechanism could be multifactorial, and um, it can be from systemic uh, inflammation to oxygen supply demand issues, ACE2 mediated direct damage where there is direct viral uh, invasion into the myocardium causing injury. And then there is also this mechanism of direct microvascular damage with which could have disseminated intravascular coagulation. All of this really moving towards a, um, uh, a multifactorial understanding of where does this injury come from? Is it all, um, is it all a, uh, a sign of or a, um, a a sign of a patient not doing well, or is there an acute uh, injury due to the viral um, invasion? And I think that's an important uh, distinction to be made in, in this. So talking about systemic inflammation and cardiac dysfunction, there are very important pro-inflammatory cytokines that cause apoptosis of cardiomyocytes. Systolic function can be impaired through um, very important uncoupling of the L-type calcium channels, and um, uh, this could lead to, to some of the systolic dysfunction that we are seeing. And then, of course, we've seen also diastolic dysfunction that could occur due to, again, the, the uh, impaired calcium reuptake uh, by, the, by the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, by down-regulating the SR um, uh, calcium ATPase uh, uh, receptors, and then, of course, important inflammatory cytokine elevations that we have seen very, very nicely on our patients with IL-1, IL-6, and TNF, um, uh, really uh, working towards this. Uh, the ACE2 uh, receptor involvement is going to be covered by, by my colleague, Dr. Cohen, but it should also be noted that there is this expression of ACE2 receptor in the human myocardium. And so when you think about myocardial injury and the fact that this virus is looking at the, is coming into the body through these, this ACE2 receptor, it's something to think about uh, where there are also important uh, loss of function as experiments that have looked at ACE2 knockout mice and they show this increased risk of myocardial infarction, hypertension, microvascular complications, et cetera. And very important is to think about how this SARS-CoV-2 -CoV -2 uses the ACE2 receptor to enter into the human cells by endocytosis and increases the RAS activity uh, due to unopposed AT2 accumulation. This has been well documented and evaluated, and this is something we do know and hence the controversy that Dr. Cohen will talk about. The early report of the myocardial injury in uh, COVID-19 came from a single center um, on January 20th to February 10th, where a total of 416 patients in Wuhan, China, had laboratory-confirmed COVID-19. They were included in the final analysis, and they just looked at elevation of troponin, high sensitivity, sensitivity troponin above 99 percentile of the upper limit normal, regardless of any new abnormalities of ECG and echocardiography. So it's important. This really was the very first report. And they showed about a 20 percent involvement. These patients were more often older. They had more um, often had chest pain. And all of the uh, risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, coronary disease, cerebrovascular disease, and chronic heart failure was much more prominent in these patients who did have cardiac injury. Uh, and uh, if you look also with COPD, um, as well as um, with cancer, they were also uh, more often seen in those patients as a history. So the cardiac injury was really happening in the more sicker patients. So how do you divide that and how do you make important changes. Importantly, the baseline lab and ratio findings, radio and, and uh, radiographic findings in COVID-19 patients with or without myocardial infarction uh, injury was also very, very different. Much, much higher 
um, uh, rates of all of the cytokines, and you can see them all listed. All, all, all of these were much, much higher in patients who did have in these 82 patients who did have my, um, myocardial injury, and more often they had pneumonia or presenting with their um, uh, uh, lung findings. Very important was the association and outcomes of patients with myocardial injury and a linear correlation to the level of the troponin elevation and mortality, such that the higher the troponin levels, uh, the higher the mortality. Very, very interesting um, look at this. And then, of course, the complications were also more often seen with acute kidney injury and ARDS in these patients, as well as... Um, obviously, much higher mortality, those patients who had myocardial uh, injury. And um, uh, another report in JAMA uh, actually did look at 187 patients, again from Wuhan, with underlying, um, uh, those patients who had underlying cardiovascular disease and an elevated troponin had a higher mortality. And you can see that uh, the if you didn't have it, you still had an elevation of your um, of your uh, mortality rates, but still much, much lower. So yes, there was a co-location of, of myocardial injury and uh, previous cardiovascular disease, but also in healthy individuals without cardiovascular disease, it was also associated with higher mortality. So that was an important, I think, finding that was presented. From our patient population at Mount Sinai, let me just share with you what, what my colleagues published in Jack. 2,700 patients admitted to Mount Sinai Hospital, and we actually look at the, looked at the patients with lower and, and higher different levels of troponin, looking at the uh, troponin levels as well as, um, and you can see the numbers and the incredible number of African-American patients um, who were inflicted by this, um, you know, 30%, 60% or so having uh, with an African-American pop patient population. And mortality was uh, um, correlated with the level of troponin elevation, such that you can see the odds ratio 1.75 for lower elevation versus uh, the three odds ratio of three when you, or, uh, when you had a higher elevation of troponin, and you could see this very, very nicely amongst hospitalized patients, much higher risk of mortality, the higher was the troponin levels, um, and um, you can see these, uh, the survival curves. And then finally, I want to just say, are there any treatments? I know there's major, large, the recovery trial is ongoing, there's large, large studies looking at how to, how to um, treat patients, and there's a major uh, colchicine trial that's ongoing right now for treatment of myocardial injury, but this very early result from our um, colleagues in Greece that was published in uh, just last week, I wanted to share with you, with 110 randomized patients with COVID-19, uh, looking at um, colchicine 1.5 milligram loading dose followed by 0.5 milligrams after 60 minutes and maintenance twice daily up to up to three weeks. Um, and what they did show in a very interesting fashion is that, yes, of course, the primary endpoint was time to baseline clinical deterioration. This is not a large study. It really is a very, very early look or an early study looking at this, but very interesting uh, to, uh, to see that uh, the important secondary endpoints were no differences in the high sensitivity troponin or C-reactive protein between colchicine and the control group. But interesting, some, some signal of maybe um, a two-grade increase in the ordinal clinical scale of improvement with colchicine, one of the oldest drugs, cheapest drugs uh, available. And we just saw the dexamethasone in the overall, but this is really for patients with myocardial injury. So in conclusion, I think there's a lot out there um, regarding myocardial injury. We are still learning as we're coming along. And I think that um, uh, the vast, um, uh, the large uh, scale study on colchicine will be very, very interesting to see. Um, Jean-Claude uh, Tardif is, is running that in, um, in uh, Canada. 
um, in Montreal, and, and we look forward to more and more randomized large-scale studies. But for now, we do know that myocardial injury in COVID-19 is associated with a much higher mortality, and these patients have to be really surveyed very, very closely. Thank you so much for your attention. Great. Thank you, Roxana, uh, for your expert summary. So we learned that there is an association indeed between uh, uh, myocardial injury and uh, uh, clinical outcomes. And you also explore some potential uh, future therapies, of course, if this will uh, uh, prove to be evidence-based. So thank you uh, very much. So, uh, Dukwo, if you agree, we move to the next uh, talk. So we save some time for the discussion. And I would ask uh, uh, David Cohen to share his thoughts about the other important association that we have learned of, which is about uh, COVID-19 and RAS blockers. David. Well, thank you very much, uh, Davide and DW. Uh, and uh, again, I'd like to congratulate the, uh, the organizers for putting this uh, uh, virtual meeting together. It's sad not to be together with everybody, but it is very nice to see everyone's uh, uh, faces. So I'm joining you uh, live here from uh, Kansas City, Missouri, right here in the middle of the, the United States, where we have not had too much uh, COVID yet, but I've obviously been following uh, very, very uh, actively a lot of the work. And the topic uh, for my discussion this morning is uh, the intersection between COVID-19 and uh, renin-angiotensin uh, re receptor uh, uh, and antagonists. Uh, these are my disclosures, none are particularly relevant to this uh, talk. So I'm going to cover four topics in about 10 minutes. I'm going to talk about um, why are we interested in uh, renin-angiotensin uh, antagonists, uh, what have we learned so far, uh, what research is ongoing, and then uh, just a very brief uh, summary and curve and recommendation. So uh, just to dive right in, uh, why is there interest in the renin-angiotensin system? Uh, Roxana already shared uh, 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 some of this information, but I just want to uh, reiterated briefly is there's a lot of preclinical evidence that there is involvement uh, of the uh, 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 um, uh, the renin angiotensin system or the receptors uh, for that related to uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection. In particular, uh, the ACE2 receptor, which is uh, on the surface of uh, you know lots and lots of uh, uh, epithelium, in particular the respiratory epithelium, um, is the port of entry. This is where the, uh, the spike protein on the uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, binds and gains entry uh, to the cells. And so one of the theories and one of the things that's been shown in animal models is that when animals are treated with uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, there's upregulation of the receptor and that can lead to increased cell entry. Uh, and there's been concern really uh, from the very beginning once the virus was understood uh, that this could potentially potentiate uh, the rate of, of infection in the viral load in humans. Uh, on the other hand, there is also some preclinical evidence that ACE inhibitors and ARBs could be beneficial. Um, and the mechanism here um, is because uh, 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 angiotensin converting enzyme, one of its main uh, effects is to convert uh, angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Uh, angiotensin 2 can then start and initiate uh, an inflammatory uh, cascade in response to the SARS CoV 2 virus. Uh, and so it, it's possible. Uh, again, in animal models to demonstrate some reduction in lung injury through treatment uh, of animals with uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, that reduce the production of, of angiotensin II. So there's this, these competing hypotheses, and there is not a clear answer as to which one would be more important. And then finally, uh, as was alluded to, there have been, very, from the very earliest uh, days when uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, began in China, um, and then in Italy, uh, there was suggestion that patients with hypertension uh, were much more likely to develop severe manifestations of, of uh, COVID-19. And so the animal data, uh, the mechanistic data, and these early clinical observations really led to concerns that treatment of patients with ACE inhibitors and ARBs might increase the risk of uh, COVID-19 after viral exposure. Uh, and this really kind of began to uh, hit the scene uh, in late February and early March, as the uh, epidemic was uh, taking off really uh, in Italy uh, and in Europe, um, and there led to a, a large number of uh, articles in the lay press uh, about uh, uh, that contributed to a lot of worry on the part of our patients as whether they should uh, continue uh, to take uh, prescribed drugs like uh, 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 ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So all of these things conspired together to really raise a lot of concern and a lot of interest in trying to understand the effect of these drugs. Uh, so with that, there has been a plethora 
uh, of research, uh, almost all observational so far, about the relationship between treatment with uh, ARBs and uh, ACE inhibitors and COVID-19. And really the first study comes from uh, our colleagues uh, uh, in Italy from the Lombardy uh, region published, oops, this is, uh, sorry, this is the wrong paper here, but the, 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 the uh, publication is correct. Um, so this was a, a study of about 6,000 uh, 6, COVID positive cases. It was a case control study from the Lombardy region. They were matched with about 30,000 non-COVID cases. Uh, and then uh, multiple logistic regression was used to examine the association between pretreatment, these patients who were taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and the incidence of uh, COVID-19. And you can see here a, a, a summary of one of the main tables from the paper about the association between ACEs and, and ARBs and the incidence of COVID-19. And if you look just at the top two rows here, uh, you can see the unadjusted odds ratios were significant. Uh, with respect to both ACE inhibitors and, and, and ARBs, they were associated with an increased incidence of COVID-19. But once we adjusted for age, sex, and other comorbidities, uh, there was really no effect uh, in the study between, again, taking these medications and the incidence of uh, COVID-19 uh, in Lombardy, Italy. Uh, then a second study published in the same exact uh, issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, this one coming out of New York City uh, from the group at NYU, um, they studied about 12,000 patients uh, who were uh, tested for COVID-19 in the NYU health system. This was a, um, uh, um, a, a cohort study. So they did propensity matching to compare patients who received different classes of antihypertensive medications versus matched antihypertensive patients. So a whole cohort of patients with hypertension comparing different medications within the class. And again, similar to the findings from the Italian study, uh, there was no association in this hypertensive population between uh, the use of ACE inhibitors, or ARBs, and the likelihood of a positive test for COVID-19 in this 12,000 patient cohort. Uh, and there was also a suggestion that there was not an association between medication classes and those patients who presented with more severe disease as well. The third study, and probably the best one to date, actually was just published a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago uh, in JAMA. Uh, and this study, like uh, so many of the good epidemiologic studies uh, today, uh, comes from Denmark, uh, from one of these Scandinavian countries that has really excellent national databases to track these things. Um, uh, and they used all of the data, the administrative registries in Denmark to link the prescription records to know what patients were taking with diagnostic codes. Uh, there were two components to the study. One was a nested case control design to assess the association between the medication class and whether the patients were diagnosed with COVID-19, so looking at incidence. And then a second study was a cohort design among patients who tested positive to look to see whether patients who tested positive for COVID-19 had a worse prognosis if they were being treated with ACE inhibitors or ARBs at the time that they were tested, in particular, looking at mortality. Uh, and so this is the incident study. This is the case control study looking at whether ACE AR, uh, ACEs and ARBs affected the incidence of uh, COVID-19 among, uh, uh, among hypertensive patients. And again, very similar to what was seen in the NYU study, there was no real association between ACE and ARB use uh, and, uh, uh, in the previous six months and a diagnosis of COVID-19. And in fact, if you look specifically at the other uh, medic specific medications, whether it was ACE inhibitors or ARBs, again, neutral association here. So really no evidence that uh, uh, taking these medications was harmful in terms of patients who um, would get the disease. Then again, the second question, what about the prognosis? Does this influence how the course of the disease is? Uh, and again, here, what you see is looking in the unadjusted model. So there, in the crude analysis, there was a very strong association between use of a, uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs and mortality or whether the patient developed severe COVID-19. However, again, once you adjusted for age and other characteristics, that whole association really melted away, uh, suggesting that there really is not a clinical uh, relationship between ACE and ARBs uh, and uh, the prognosis of the disease. So again, very reassuring and very consistent data. Now there's a fourth study, and we're gonna ignore this for now, but the fourth study was actually published briefly in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the uh, surges surgisphere study that really got a lot of a press and a lot of people thinking about publications. Uh, this was uh, uh, based allegedly on data from uh, 169 hospitals on six continents. And I won't go into the details. We can discuss this more in the uh, a discussion period if we have some time. Uh, the most important thing about this paper is that it was retracted 
um, um, about a month after it was originally published. Uh, and in the retraction, uh, Dr. Mera, the uh, uh, principal investigator, uh, wrote, because all the authors were not granted access to the raw data, uh, which could also not be made available to a third party auditor, we're unable to validate the data sources underlying our article and we requested the article be retracted. We can discuss this more if we have time. It certainly has been an interesting uh, 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 sidelight uh, in the whole story. Um, so that's really the epidemiologic data we have to date. So what is the future? What is going on uh, at the present time? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize that these studies, even though they're large, even though they've been published in some very important uh, 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 and highly cited medical journals, um, there are not, you know, they're not perfect studies. Uh, some of the mortality studies in particular have significant informative censoring because um, all these studies are being done in real time and many patients are still in the hospital at the time of the data harvest. So the outcomes for a large a fraction of some of the mortality studies are not necessarily known. Um, for all the studies that we've looked at so far, the exposure uh, was defined as pre-procedure ACE ARB prescription. Um, and what that means is we really can't, based on these studies, assess the impact of continued treatment during COVID-19 on prognosis. We just, we really don't know the answer to that question. And then finally, of course, these are all retrospective observational studies. As we all know, those are subject to uh, residual confounding. Now, fortunately, uh, because of all the interest in this topic, there are a lot of randomized trials that are ongoing. Just to give you an idea of them, uh, this is a very nice uh, uh, table that uh, uh, one of the nephrology journals uh, put together. But these are the ongoing trials that are, um, you know, already underway. So here are there are five trials of uh, ACE and ARB continuation versus discontinuation in patients hospitalized for COVID-19, um, and then again uh, one trial of ACE uh, ARB continuation versus discontinuation in patients with a hypertension but without COVID-19. So these are sort of treatment trials. Should we keep patients on? their ACE inhibitors and their ARBs, or should we discontinue them? And this is even a prevention trial. Then in addition, there actually are six randomized trials ongoing of whether we should treat patients um, who get COVID-19 with ACEs and ARBs. Uh, there are six placebo-controlled trials for patients who are either inpatients or outpatients uh, with COVID-19. And then finally, there's at least another eight trials that have been registered, although as far as we know, they have not yet been started. Uh, again, these are all trials of ACE ARB initiation. Um, uh, versus placebo as treatment for either outpatient or hospitalized COVID-19. Uh, and just interestingly, this list includes a 10,000 patient trial in Nigeria and Pakistan, which is a, a, a two by two by two factorial design that also includes aspirin and simvastatin as, as active uh, 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 components. And there's at least one trial of nebulized captopril, which is something I had never really heard of. Uh, uh, before, uh, for obviously for uh, uh, pulmonary manifestations. So there is no shortage of trials. One of these uh, treatment trials actually is, has just recently enrolled all of its patients. So I, I think we will start to see some of these results emerge, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months. So let me just then finish up with a summary and a couple of current uh, you know, recommendations as to what we do. So to my eye, looking at this, uh, this literature that has emerged over the last couple of months, um, although there are clear animal data suggesting that treatment with uh, these inhibitors uh, uh, may increase susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2, the relevance of these findings to humans remains unknown. Uh, the early data that suggested an association between ACE and ARB use uh, and rates of COVID-19 infection were highly confounded by age and comorbid conditions, and thus far the data from observational studies are very consistent, uh, demonstrating no significant association between use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs in either susceptibility to COVID-19 infection or the prognosis once infected. And so the recommendations, I think it's very nice just to summarize this uh, uh, concluding statement from the Heart Failure Society of America, the ACC and the AHA. Uh, they recommend continuation of RAS uh, antagonists for those patients who are currently prescribed these agents for indications where, these, where they are known to be beneficial, such as high, heart failure or hypertension or ischemic heart disease. Uh, in the event that patients with cardiovascular disease are diagnosed with COVID-19, we have to individualize our treatment decisions according to each patient's hemodynamic status and clinical presentations. So I think, uh, you know, just generally good advice, keep these things going when we know that they're beneficial, because at this point, uh, the evidence of harm uh, is a, a circumstantial uh, at best. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back over uh, to uh, the moderators. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. The terrific lecture from David Cohen. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the last uh, lecture from the Dr. Dominic Angelillo, 
COVID-19 and the thrombotic or thromboembolic disease. Could you please start your lecture? Well, uh, thank you, uh, DW, and thank you for the uh, kind invite and congratulations again to uh, TCT Asia Pacific for uh, organizing this, uh, uh, this session. Um, it is a pleasure for me to present uh, here from, uh, from Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, this topic of uh, COVID-19 and thrombotic disorders. And uh, the uh, uh, epicenter in the United States, as you know, has moved, shifted from uh, where Dr. Moran uh, uh, was experiencing it uh, a few months ago to here in, in Florida with nearly 10,000 cases uh, uh, per day. And so uh, it further emphasizes the importance uh, of uh, social distancing and wearing masks, all measures that uh, unfortunately here in our state, uh, we have not taken that, uh, uh, that seriously. So um, uh, these are my uh, disclosures. None of these relate to the content of my presentation. And I will start off with the, uh, with the pathophysiology. And as we've heard uh, uh, previously, uh, COVID-19 is primarily a, a respiratory disease, uh, and it is uh, due to the fact that the uh, uh, COVID-19 virus primarily attacks uh, the, uh, uh, the receptor on the type 2 pneumocytes in the lung. But uh, you can see here, this leads to an inflammatory response, uh, which leads to why this is a primarily a hypoxic uh, a disorder. But as part of this uh, uh, inflammatory response, you can see that the uh, disease can also transmit to the uh, surrounding vessels in uh, the, uh, the lungs, leading to uh, uh, endothelial dysfunction, stasis, and by definition, the inflammatory response is a pro-coagulant. So you see uh, what, what's on this screen is uh, what is known as the inflammatory immune thrombotic uh, disorder. And uh, this is also one of the reasons why uh, we have in many of our COVID-19 patients, a lot of what is called uh, pulmonary embolism, which is in situ. Now, typically in clinical practice, we know that a lot of the PEs derive from DVT. Now, this also happens in COVID-19. Uh, but uh, one thing that emerged particularly from the uh, uh, French experience is that nearly 30% of patients going down to a CT scan, uh, although not having any necessary symptoms uh, for PE, were found to have uh, thrombotic, uh, 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 thrombotic disorders. So uh, this is the uh, pathophysiology, and I would like to uh, 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 go to the uh, next slide, which uh, really goes back to the basics of why COVID-19 is a thrombotic disorder. And if we recall the uh, ABCs of why thrombosis occurs and the Virchow's triad, right? We have endothelial injury, which we just explained. Uh, this uh, can lead to a hypercoagulability, uh, also induced by the inflammatory status and uh, uh, abnormal blood flow, in other words, stasis. And you can see that the components interact with, with each other. This is the primary mechanism why you have clot development. And based on the factors that prevail, uh, these can be more uh, prevalent in the uh, venous territory or in the arterial territory. Clearly now with COVID-19, uh, because of the abnormal uh, blood flow and the hypercoagulability uh, related more to coagulation factors rather than uh, platelets, we uh, do have a higher prevalence of true uh, thromboembolic disorders. Nevertheless, uh, as we also have heard from uh, Dr. Moran's presentation, we have a, a series of purely arterial thrombotic disorders. Uh, many of these, which have uh, emerged over the past uh, few uh, months, as many atypical uh, arterial uh, uh, thrombotic uh, disorders. So again, pathophysiology uh, is extremely uh, important. The other thing that we've uh, learned, and this is more from the latter uh, experience from China and from, uh, from Italy, and like to remind that particularly in Italy, there were a lot of uh, government issues when it came to uh, performing autopsy studies. Had they been done sooner, we'd have learned a lot more, uh, clearly showing how the uh, development uh, of, uh, of, of thrombus in uh, small vessels, which further confirms uh, the uh, importance uh, of, uh, of the thrombotic disorder, but also supports the importance uh, of potential need 
for antithrombotic agents because this disorder that we're seeing here is a primary reason for a progression of a disease, particularly those patients who are going into a, a, a multi-organ failure. The question becomes uh, at this point, is that these patients uh, may need uh, anticoagulant therapy, uh, and we'll get to that in a few seconds. Now, on the other side, uh, we already uh, saw the mechanisms of cardiac injury. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, primarily uh, related to a type two uh, 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 mechanic uh, 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 cardiac injury because uh, there, these are sick patients, there's increased demand and on the same time, they're hypoxic. Uh, but again, uh, there are direct mechanisms related not only because of ACE2 on the myocardium, uh, but because we do have an inflammatory response. And these can lead to these plaque ruptures, many times multiple plaque ruptures, and therefore contribution uh, to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the thrombotic uh, disorder per se. And then last but not least, we have the disseminated intravascular coagulation, which I'll get back to in a few seconds. So uh, this uh, a slide from uh, the recent Big Deli paper and, and, and Jack really summarizes it all. We have uh, a number of risk factors that uh, lead uh, to uh, the uh, thrombotic uh, disorder, but clearly it's the inflammatory immune thrombotic response that uh, mediates uh, the uh, thrombotic disorder. And again, if you remember, uh, the uh, Virchow's triad, if you look at to the different components, that's what leads to the uh, uh, thromboembolic or pure arterial thrombotic disorders to uh, uh, prevail. And uh, we know that there's a clear association between the thrombotic disorders and uh, the uh, and uh, laboratory markers, I would say most importantly, the, the dimers and fibrinogen uh, levels. Now, this is a very important concept because we speak a lot about uh, this disorder as being a disseminated intravascular coagulation. That is true, but this is only towards the end stage. Now, remember, disseminated intravascular coagulation is a consumptive coagulopathy, but this only happens at the end. Remember, fibrinogen levels are actually increased at the beginning. Why? D-dimers are uh, uh, a marker for increase in fibrin. This is the reason why we have a thrombotic disorder. So the disseminated intravascular coagulation where you start having your rays and PT and PTT is really towards the end. And unfortunately, really towards the end and when it's a little bit too late. And I do believe that this has important implications for, uh, uh, for treatment. Here you see the, uh, some of the experience coming from our Asian colleagues showing the association with uh, uh, coagulation abnormalities. Uh, clearly, the dimers is one of the uh, 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 earlier markers. But again, as I mentioned before, uh, the reduction in platelet count or prolongation in PT uh, and PTT is a little bit later. And again, this is uh, observational data where we did not know much. But clearly, the observation of positive D dimers uh, raised the question whether we should be using prophylactic anticoagulation. And the uh, short answer is, is yes. Uh, this is a recent article uh, uh, published in Jack coming from the Mount Sinai uh, experience, uh, where Mount Sinai actually learned a lot from our uh, French colleagues, uh, where they started to implement uh, 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 anticoagulation. Uh, but uh, again, the uh, rapid surge that was observed in New York City allowed to uh, conduct these studies. Again, these were observational, nearly 3,000 patients, showing that uh, patients treated with anticoagulation uh, uh, did have uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some benefit. And this is further emphasized again in the uh, recent consensus document from Big Deli, uh, showing that essentially the uh, threshold for use of anticoagulation really should be uh, should be is low. Uh, now there is not a, a general consensus on all the details, and a lot of consensus documents out there each one saying some little different things. I'll just give you a little bit what's my interpretation of this with the understanding that we don't have yet clinical trials uh, on the topic. They're ongoing. I think the key question when it comes to anticoagulation is when to start, which drug, which dose, and for how long. We can speak for hours on this. I'll give you my quick answer. I believe we need to start early. Now, if you know I'm in hospitalized patients with COVID-19, these, these patients are isolated to a bed. They're not moving. Okay, I think they, they would probably need prophylaxis regardless. Um, 
I believe that the treatment of choice should be low molecular heparin at the beginning. And the reason for this, low molecular heparins uh, do interact with the spike protein on, uh, uh, on the SARS-CoV-2. And because of their immune uh, modulating uh, effects, there are also other aspects when it comes to anticoagulant effect per se. We can speak about this a little bit later. Uh, I do believe that they should start early with a prophylaxis dose, obviously proceed to a full therapeutic dose once uh, uh, they do develop uh, uh, true thrombotic disorders, and they should continue with uh, a treatment for two weeks after discharge, preferably with a, a NOAC. Now, one thing to keep in mind when it comes to uh, anticoagulants is the drug-drug uh, interactions that may occur with the antivirals. This is one of the benefits of low molecular heparins. They don't interact with any of the antivirals, uh, while this may occur with the NOACs. Fortunately, of all the antivirals that are out there, remdesivir, which is ahead of the curve, uh, does not have an interaction, particularly with uh, a CYP3A4. We heard very eloquently from Roxana the, uh, uh, the implications of, of myocardial injury uh, and uh, outcomes, which uh, uh, are worse than patients with cardiovascular disease. I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm going to focus more on the uh, practical uh, uh, aspects. Uh, like with all things we do in our clinical practice, when we have a laboratory value, we need to put it into clinical context, okay? So what does a positive troponin mean? Should we be measuring it everybody? Well, you measure a troponin uh, if you know you're going to be doing something uh, uh, with it. And there again, uh, distinguishing being your type 1s and your type 2s is, is very, very critical. But then it comes to, you know, how are we managing these patients? A lot of debates on, for example, what do we do with these STEMI patients coming, coming in? Should they go to primary PCI? Should they be treated with lytics? Uh, consensus documents saying very different things. I've seen the protocol that Mount Sinai put together on how they reserve uh, uh, lytics for the uh, lower risk uh, 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 STEMIs. Um, at our institution, we've adopted a strategy of primary PCI uh, uh, for all. Uh, some regions in Italy or in Spain, they have centralized systems. What's important is that there is a protocol in place. Because one thing that I can say during this entire pandemic is the sense of confusion, what confusion leads to is incredible. And so each institution needs to, to have uh, protocols on how to manage these patients. Which then leads us to uh, the question, when we do have an ACS patient, when we do have a non-STEMI or, or STEMI, which is the P2Y12 inhibitor uh, of choice. Uh, in my opinion, clopidogrel uh, uh, should not be used because it's a weak antithrombotic agent. There are a lot of drug-drug interactions. Uh, the uh, drug that's associated with least drug interaction is actually uh, prasugrel. As you know, ticagrelor does have a box warning uh, for drug interaction with antivirals. So one of the concerns that we have here is what if these patients end up getting enrolled in some type of trial with an antiviral uh, that interferes with 3A4, and we don't know about it. And many times the infectious disease folks that are running these trials know nothing about ticagrelor. And so that's the reason why Prasil, perhaps a little bit more of a friendlier drug in terms of uh, drug interactions. My last bullet point is what you see here. Uh, don't forget, most COVID-19 patients are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms, okay? We know that many of our patients with cardiovascular disease are commonly infected, and many uh, are, these patients are on antiplatelet therapy. I cannot tell you how many phone calls I get, messages in my Epic inbox from primary care providers or patients saying, should I be switching my antiplatelet therapy because of COVID-19. I have a fever. Should I stop my Plavix? Should I switch to an anticoagulant? The short answer is no. Okay, if you're doing fine, you do not switch, okay, and you keep on your treatment uh, as, as, uh, as, as usual. Uh, same concept as when it comes to your uh, uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, because we know that with switching therapies, there is also an increased risk of bleeding complications. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, thank Dominic. You. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Uh, thank you for uh, your uh, expert insight into the uh, issues with the antithrombotic therapy in COVID-19 patients. So now we have uh, some time for the discussion, and I would like to take advantage of the presence of many brilliant colleagues uh, who were uh, unlikely, of course, uh, uh, part of the epicenter at different point in time. 
uh, we will start in the chronological order somehow because uh, Bill Gogas here represents uh, China. Then we will have also Dr. Kim uh, for South Korea. Then it was the time for Italy and we will ask Alaide Kefo and then UK. And we have here uh, uh, Mamas Mamas. So my question for uh, each of you is, uh, first of all, how is the situation in your respective uh, area? And second, uh, if uh, there is uh, any um, position of your uh, unit or hospital regarding the three topics that we mentioned today. So uh, do you have any special recommendation in your hospital regarding how to handle uh, increasing uh, uh, myocardial enzymes, how you handle rust blockers, and uh, if you have any protocols for uh, antithrombotic therapy? So concise answers, please, but we want to know about different practices in different parts of the world. So Bill, if you can uh, start, please. Yeah, so... Yeah, the epicenter in, in China, in Wuhan, was back in February. February, March was the peak. And uh, in my city, I was in Nanjing. It was about 300,000 kilometers away. And there was a very low number of cases. And uh, as you know, the, the hospitals in China were divided in designated hospitals for treatment of COVID positive patients and non-designated hospitals. So our center was a center for and non-COVID positive patients. But it's, it's important to note that uh, the testing involved both a CT scan, but also a swab. And uh, this was provided by the local authorities for free. And so the patients together with the clinical questions, if they had fever, if they were, uh, you know, they had a relative with uh, fever, if they had been to Wuhan or any other uh, place close to the epicenter. So there was clinical questions. There was a swab and the CT scan. The CT scan was, basically in 10 minutes was out. So there was an idea if the patient had a minimal disease in his lungs and then we were waiting the swab. And as long as the patient was COVID negative and was presenting with an ACS or with a stem, then was coming to our hospital for treatment. But if the patient was COVID positive, was going to the designated hospital and the primary treatment option was thrombolysis. And there was a dispute, uh, either thrombolysis or primary PCI, but the, 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 the primary course of treatment uh, at this time was thrombolysis. And of course, there were many patients with, uh, with STEMIs that they didn't present at all. And by the end of March, beginning of April, uh, when you know the patients were coming because then the lockdown was uh, released, we were seeing many late presentations of, sub of uh, subtotal occlusions that we were ready to open because the patients were staying at home. Uh, with pain and with some, uh, you know, taking some pills, uh, calling the primary care physicians. And this was a sort of the situation. Uh, of course, you know, the troponin levels, the troponin leaks and the CKCPMV were elevated, but uh, in those uh, patients. And uh, the coagulopathy, which is very, very important. Uh, there were no, no sweets in our patients, so we were giving them uh, aspirin plus uh, clopidogrel, and uh, as long as uh, there was no history of uh, any bleeding condition or any predisposition to bleeding, we could give them a uh, Uh You know, for the patients who were COVID-19 positive in a very serious clinical condition that they were hospitalized, of course, low molecular weight uh, heparin uh, was administered because those patients were staying at least one week in the hospital. Uh, without walking in the bed, and uh, this was, in general, uh, the situation. So now, uh, things have uh, changed. Uh, the hospitals have completely opened. Uh, there is only a, a small a small area in Beijing that uh, describes some cases, uh, and this, these areas there are partly in lockdown, but in the rest of the country, uh, things are working uh, pretty, pretty, pretty well. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, Dr. Kiba, what is the situation in uh, South Korea and what is the practice uh, you can share? Uh, hi, I'm In Chuk Kim from Kemyong University Tongsana Hospital, um, uh, which is located in Daegu, South Korea. Daegu, where I live, has become one of the famous cities in Korea uh, related with COVID 19 outbreak. We had a very early outbreak experience. Uh, in this um, COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, and we have settled some of the medical and social strategies to deal with the virus disease. We had a very uh, good experience regarding it. And 
Uh, in Korea now, we have 12,000 cases confirmed uh, with 2.2% uh, of case fatality, which is uh, better than the whole um, world. And uh, our, I think our unique feature of the initial transmission pattern is that the, most of the cases are occurred in uh, some special area, uh, Daegu City, where I live, and adjacent area, North Gyeongsang province. And from the end of the March, uh, the, the case of um, uh, uh, Daegu City uh, is kind of plateaued, but cases from other regions are still increasing daily. 20 to 50 cases are confirmed uh, recently, uh, and Seoul is one of the cities. So um, that is our um, concern still going on. And um, our first case was started uh, from January 20. And after one month of quiescent period, outbreak initiated from our city, as I have mentioned. And um, uh, this was started from a religious event, uh, as all Koreans know. And we um, focused on, um, uh, we have several strategies to uh, overcome the situation, focusing on um, COVID-19 patients. We had collective isolation for general non-serious patients and university hospitals was um, operated for the uh, serious patients uh, at a negative pressure isolation uh, intensive care unit or uh, negative pressure isolation specialized rooms and uh, we also operated self-care facilities for mild or no symptom uh, patients. And, that's, um, and the social policy was, um, was strict home isolation and inhibit public gathering and utilizing temporary telemedicines. And that was our um, strategies. And um, I would like to uh, mention um, about the uh, COVID-19 related myocardial injury. Uh, my opinion is that the unified definition is very important as uh, Dr. Roxana Marin uh, have mentioned. Uh, I think that was a very good point that we have, we need unified definitions for myocardial injury. And um, uh, Dr. Mara mentioned that the troponin I is very important but I think also electrocardiography and echocardiography findings is also important to um, describe all the patho uh, all the complicated pathophysiological mechanisms related with COVID-19. So I think it is better to um, uh, better to adopt uh, all the possible diagnostic modalities to find myocardial injury or to find uh, the patients, COVID-19 patients, myocardial injury for, uh, to, to screen who is at risk. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, mention the strategies about uh, diagnostic test, tests for COVID-19 patients. Uh, if the pa patient has no symptom, we don't have to uh, force to do the um, uh, all the tests because uh, of the concern of the disease transmission. So if the patient has a chest pain or dyspnea, I think it is recommended to test biomarkers or electrocardiography or echocardiography uh, in COVID-19 patients. Okay, Alaida, then it was Italy around the late February and the beginning of March. Can you share uh, your practice? Yes, so Italy, but uh, in Italy there were some difference uh, among the different regions. And uh, so the first, we have to say that the first region in the Western countries that was hit, literally hit like a tsunami by this uh, infection was Lombardy region. It occurs 40 kilometers from Milano. And by the way, this was a case uh, uh, the case one uh, coming from Germany he had contact with some Chinese customers and unfortunately decided to come <laughs> to close to Milano. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say, initially, there was some delay in understanding. There was intuition of a woman anesthesiologist to test the patient, uh, the Italian patient. And then we start to have uh, the recognition of the problem. Having said that, the first case was declared to be 21st of February 
but indeed there are now going back uh, some evidence that the virus was here in late December, early January, but unfortunately this was not diagnosed, uh, um, as I said. So um, the current uh, situation now is that we had in Italy 240,000 uh, cases uh, at the present time is 16,000 patients and again uh, more than uh, I have to say 60% uh, of the cases are still in our region. Mm -hmm. So for example today cases uh, uh, positive in the Lombardy region is 10,000 over we said 16,000. Um, clearly the situation now is much better and when we were hit initially by the virus and again this was a tsunami because we were not expected and honestly the information coming from China at that time were not so clear and we learned just on the field how this disease is very more is uh, so different from what was told us at the beginning like a pneumonia something else i have to say and i think that during this presentation this was quite uh, clear we had so rapidly to reorganize anything uh, and by the way there was some delay in closing the region and this was very unfortunate i have to say we have to consider that lombardy region is the region that is more productive you know the country we do much of the economy of the country and so there was some delay in closing the region and we were all the 21 uh, region were closed at the same time without difference from the fact that we were it and the southern part of the Italy was not it at all. Having said that as I had uh, I was saying we had to re re uh, restructure anything very rapidly and the region of Lombardy decided to do regarding cardiovascular emergency to organize a network of hub and spoke so just to give you an idea uh, clear this is a region of italy so it's a small country but uh, from 50 centers that were doing primary pci in the region they were reducted to 13 and in milano from more than 10 centers it was 13 center only three and my center was one of the three so you can imagine how a city of more than one million, one and five, if you consider all the neighborhood is served now only by three centers doing cardiovascular emergency. So as I said, one of the three centers was my hospital. So we had to rearrange anything, even turnation. We had to cut all the elective and just concentrate on cardiovascular emergency. We reorganize, uh, apart from all the region, the hospital. So there were three different entry points that I think was very nicely illustrated also in the EPCI uh, position statement that I had the, uh, the fortune to chair and was published in European Art Journal. That was reflecting what happened actually in my hospital as uh, uh, testifying what happened in severely affected regions of, of Europe. So we had three different entry points. One entry point was for COVID suspected or diagnosed patient, just to consider that they were also transferred from other cities and uh, part of the, of the region. Then there was one entry point for not cardiovascular and not suspected COVID. And there was an entry point that was dedicated to cardiovascular emergency. And we had to organize also emergency room just for uh, cardiology patients. So over there, there was the decision point. So by definition, all the patients coming with ST elevation MI on very high risk non-ST elevation MI, uh, very high risk were considered as ST elevation MI and they went rapidly to Calab. So there was no space for thrombolysis in our institution and in the region because of the organization of this new network. And when they were arriving in the Calab, everybody was uh, uh, considered as to be positive, even if there was not a diagnosis and there was not a suspect. So we were using PPE and all the, uh, the attention uh, as if they were positive. Uh, indeed, uh, all the others, so non-high risk, uh, non-ST elevation MI, 
we kept them in the emergency room we did the swab and if they were negative if they were positive they were going to the covid area if they were negative they were staying in the cardiological uh, pathway uh, as it was again illustrated in that european journal publication um, we change a little bit uh, according to the guidelines in the sense that uh, uh, primary PCI was the strategy of choice of ST elevation MI and also urgent and emergent CALAB for very high risk. For all the others, we, um, if they were high risk, again, they were tested and then went to the CALAB, intermediate and low risk, no way. I mean, they were, uh, it was chosen a conservative uh, treatment. Clearly, this happened in the really early phase of the pandemic. Nowadays, the situation is going better. And this threshold went a little bit down and we slowly, very slowly restarted our elective activity. Uh, regarding the topic that were touched, uh, like myocardial injury, it was clear to us. Uh, um, I collaborated with um, other centers in the region and we had the publication in circulation that showed uh, our COVID case uh, of ST elevation MI. I have to say that uh, uh, we did not have so many COVID positive ST elevation MI, as I said, but on them, uh, uh, we have to say that 40% had not culprit uh, lesion. So we started to understand that that was a different phenomenon. And there was a problem, problem of uh, myocardial injury that actually was not evident with all the story started in our region. Um, having said that, so on the myocardial injury in the hospital at the beginning of the phases, uh, all the patients underwent troponin and we saw uh, the, the same uh, trends and the same uh, correlation as in all the publications that have been done so far. Uh, regarding antiplatelet therapy, I absolutely agree with Dominic. Uh, we were aware of the interaction between some antiviral agents and clopidogrel tecagrel, so we tried to be on the prasugrel side, clearly depending on, on some patient, but in general we were on the prasugrel. And uh, all the discussion of microtrombi, we, we were perfectly aware, we were starting even to do OCT in, uh, in those patients in the pulmonary uh, vessel just to try to understand if there was evidence of microthrombi, but that was a research project. Regarding these inhibitors, the same. I mean, we saw the same uh, uh, publication, but uh, we are uh, aligned to what was said. I mean, if the patient is on a inhibitor, there is no sense to change it. And then another thing is if you have to start a therapy. So again, we were severely hit. It was really not, not easy to go through that. Um, we were not prepared at the moment, but we are rapidly prepared and things now are getting much better because the government decided to close all the region. It was two months lockdown. And I think that just only with very severe and strict measurement as China uh, taught us, uh, we can... Uh, pass through all these and still we are wearing masks in, in Milano region. Okay, Alaida, thank you very much also for sharing your thoughts about organizational aspects, which is another important component of the story. Uh, Dr. Mamas, uh, how about UK? Uh, you were uh, uh, the fourth in line uh, if we uh, discuss the four countries, but of course it's a very large country and uh, it was hit very hard as well. Yes, so we have had um, over 300,000 positive cases in the United Kingdom and 43,500 deaths. So we're number two in terms of per capita death rate in the world, second only to the United States. Um, our first case was in January, January the 29th, uh, two Chinese nationals uh, visiting the United Kingdom. And the first death was the 5th of March. Um, we have had a national lockdown since the 23rd of March, many of us believing that it was probably a week to two weeks too late, but we are where we are. In terms of the national cardiovascular health of the population, uh, my group has been very fortunate. We have had access um, through the National Institute of Cardiovascular Outcomes research to live national data. 
and we're seeing a lot of interesting things. So first and foremost, we're seeing something like a 40 to 50% reduction in acute coronary syndrome cases. So that's going to be a paper that's going to come out in the Lancet shortly. We've also seen, number one, a big increase in out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. And in those that do survive coming into hospital, we're not taking them to cath lab. We've also seen um, a change in the place of death of many patients, particularly from cardiovascular disease. Patients are moving from the hospitals and dying much more in nursing homes. And I think the reason has been that um, doctors, and as well as patients, are just frightened of coming to hospital. And so a lot more people are dying in the community. So one of our other um, analyses suggests that there's been over 10,000 excess deaths uh, compared to the last decade um, using statistical modelling, even if you take out um, COVID-related deaths. In terms of um, other things that we've seen, we haven't moved towards thrombolysis in the United Kingdom. So when we've analysed our PCI registry, um, because it's a very much a hub and spoke model in the National Health Service, it's been all primary PCI. If anything, thrombolysis has slightly dropped during the COVID pandemic, which I think is a good thing. In terms of um, the way we manage our patients with regards to the three talks um, in my unit, we don't measure troponin unless we have um, a thought that it may be an acute coronary syndrome. I don't think there's much value in that you're not going to change your management by having a positive or negative troponin um, in someone that's come in with COVID if you don't suspect acute coronary syndrome. We are recognising and seeing some really good data that patients with COVID are at increased risk of thromboembolic events. So we are treating them prophylactically, um, anyone that's hospitalised, um, generally with rivaroxaban. And um, in terms of our ACE inhibitor strategy, um, as per European Society of Cardiology guidelines, we are not discontinuing uh, these drugs in patients hospitalised that may be on these medications either for heart failure or for hypertension. Thank you. Okay, very, very nice. So uh, I think uh, the, this is a very uh, nice share of each country experience. I'm gonna the quick question to the presenter and uh, and then we end up the, this session. I, I have a quick question to Loxana. And the, the uh, last week, you know, Dr. Uh, Skripal Bangalore uh, reported a case series uh, of ST elevation MI in the uh, six New York hospital. You know, some, although the number of patients is uh, uh, small and uh, more than 50% shows non-coronary myocardial injury, there are uh, variability in presentation, high prevalence of uh, non-obstructive disease, and the overall patient had a very poor prognosis. I think, uh, this pattern could be a great burden on emergent uh, decision making uh, regarding direct coronary angio or primary PCI or not. How can you conduct uh, differential diagnosis and manage ST elevation COVID-19 patients? Could you introduce in the in New York experience? I think this is a very yeah. not easy uh, question. Yes. So yes, I mean, I think uh, it was an interesting uh, publication in the New England Journal by Tripal Bangalore. Uh, 18 patients, I think, in in about six hospitals, really small numbers. I was actually surprised to see that uh, publication because I had seen larger numbers in the Italian uh, series that was also presented, but not unfortunately not accepted. But um, uh, looking at, uh, at that, and I think what taking a step back, and now that we know more, I think we can be more smarter about what we're doing. We have set up a covid uh, a lab with extra, extra precautions. But at the moment, we're really treating all patients like they all have COVID. So as far as infection to the, um, to the healthcare providers, we are really using, because we know so little about this. The big question you're asking is, in the COVID-19 patient who presents with a possible myocardial injury, who should go to the cath lab? And I think that's a very, very important question. Obviously, when you see an ST elevation on EKG with chest pain and, and, uh, and uh, important um, uh, pathognomonic signs of ST segment elevation MI, even if this could be myocarditis, etc., I think you owe it to the patient to bring them because there are so many COVID positive patients that now 
as we have heard from Dr. Angelillo, that he's seeing a COVID positive patients who also have a STEMI, true, true, unrelated, may not be a COVID related ST segment elevation MI, but we certainly would not want to miss that just because they have a COVID uh, positive diagnosis. We would bring those patients and treat them the way we would everyone else and bring them to the cath lab, but we have a policy that uh, we treat all patients as if they have COVID positivity as far as infection to other, to healthcare personnel. Now, it's possible that if you actually, and, and I like when I heard uh, Dr. Mama speak that they're not really t- measuring troponin on everyone, only in the highly suspected patients. And I think that we're doing that on everyone because we're, we're doing a lot of work in, in our data mining and trying to better understand and classify and clarify this. So that's part of some of the projects we're doing at Mount Sinai. But I think the idea that you really look at the clinical syndrome the patient's EKG findings, and then, of course, biomarkers and probably some imaging as well. All of this could be done in a very short period of time, not to lose a patient who's actually having a plaque rupture that requires balloon or technical um, uh, reopening of the artery of the infarct-related artery. But if you bring everyone to the cath lab, you will have a 50% rate of non-obstructive disease and other kinds of microvascular as well as uh, pericardial, um, you know, inflammation that could be mimicking what looks to be like an acute coronary syndrome. So we have to kind of take all of those things into consideration. My view is we should never miss the opportunity of opening an infarct-related artery. We know that is how we can save lives. So we should be making sure that we don't forget that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death still, even with the COVID pandemic. And so we've got to make sure that we don't miss the forest from the trees and leave the patients uh, untreated just because we are not, we think it's just COVID and probably non-obstructive. I think we should be very vigilant. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice answer. And the uh, second quick question to the David Cohen, you know, uh, recently uh, two paper uh, related with the surge spear was retracted in the Lancet and uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. And the, could you comment on the lesson learned from surge spear scandal in the current pandemic uh, period? How can we cope and deal with the such epidemics in uh, unprecedented chaotic area? Uh, th- thank you, DW. Yes, that, that was a very, it's been an interesting chapter uh, in this uh, uh, pandemic is, you know, again, first of all, the very large number of publications and people really rushing to try to figure out um, what's going on and what we can do to help these, you know, th- these patients. Uh, you know, clearly the, uh, the you know, the two certain, three certain sphere papers were really withdrawn. There was the one that was in the New England Journal on ACE and, uh, uh, inhibitors and ARBs. Uh, there was the one that was the most high profile, which was the one that was published in the Lancet on hydroxychloroquine. And there was a small, um, uh, also influential paper, paper that was uh, in a preprint that was withdrawn on ivermectin uh, that led uh, many of the countries in Latin America to start using the medication uh, broadly because it was purported to be I- I- extremely beneficial. Uh, I think the, the, you know, the main lesson here is that we can't, we, we can't, uh, um, Ignore our responsibility as peer reviewers and as members of the scientific community to uh, you know to really look at what we're getting. I mean, there was again this tremendous rush to try to uh, publish things quickly and to make sure that uh, you know no important information was uh, uh, missed. Uh, and as a result, I think these papers, which in retrospect had many many red flags uh, about them, and we can talk for I can you know talk for an hour about all the issues that were became obvious as the time went along. Um, but, you know, again, I think we have to be just, we have to be careful when things seem to be too good to be true. We have to look carefully at them and we cannot uh, shirk our responsibility as members of the scientific community in, uh, in, in peer review. And finally, I think, you know, perhaps the biggest message uh, that, that, that comes out of the COVID uh, pandemic with respect to science and publications is uh, the overwhelming importance of the, you know, of randomized trials. I think, uh, you know, in particular, the UK has really uh, led the way here, uh, you know, with the recovery trial, 
Uh, but I think we, you know, we see what's going on in the United States today, I think is still problematic. In the United States, we have many uh, small trials. This hospital is trying one thing. This other hospital is trying a very slightly different twist on it. Another hospital, every hospital is trying their own, uh, their own treatment. And as a result of that, what have we learned? Um, almost nothing whatsoever. Whereas the UK that was much more organized and said from the get-go, we're going to, you know, we're going to do this large, uh, very well-structured trial within the NHS. We're going to gauge all of the, uh, all the practitioners and we're going to randomize patients. And they have, you know, very quickly, you know, out of, you know, in, in a country that's a quarter the size of the United States, we have two enormous, you know, contributions from the UK, uh, both with respect to the non-benefit of hydroxychloroquine and the benefit of dexamethasone. Um, and we, you know, we need to really encourage uh, countries, these very national broad efforts uh, to uh, randomize patients so we can learn quickly because uh, rushing, to, rushing to science is not, is not a good strategy. Randomization is still the key to learning what works and what doesn't. It's great. Okay, uh, I think uh, due to the limited time, we had uh, David uh, Capodano. Could, could you pr propose just last question to present or the discussion? Yes, of course. So maybe uh, in the interest of time, we could just uh, try to wrap up the, the key messages that I've learned from the uh, nice lectures of the three speakers and correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, what I really uh, take on from the presentation of Roxana is the prognostic uh, importance of myocardial injury. We don't know whether this is a causal effect or uh, just a marker, but the higher the troponins, uh, the worse the outcomes. So we should be aware of that when we see uh, these patients with uh, uh, myocardial injury as well. But Roxana also said that don't rush to the uh, cat lab, uh, stay uh, solid, uh, of course, uh, with uh, all you know about coronary artery disease, particularly in this uh, uh, pandemic. We also learned that there is probably no uh, real association between AS inhibitors and uh, uh, COVID-19 according to the nice lecture by David Cohen. So at least this waiting for the trial seems to be at rest, but uh, we will see. And uh, from Dominic, uh, many practical messages about the use of uh, anticoagulants, uh, low molecular weight heparin uh, first, particularly because this is prophylaxis in this patient uh, who are at bed mostly. And also be aware of the interaction between uh, P2I12 inhibitors and drugs that are used for COVID-19. So if you agree and uh, if we agree that these are uh, practical lessons from this, uh, uh, I would like uh, to thank all the lecturers. I would like to thank all the panelists for sharing their thoughts from their respective countries. And maybe uh, DW, if you agree, we can wrap up this session and thank all the viewers uh, as well for watching this video. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful.